Good morning, First Baptist Aztec, and thank you for joining us in person or online. I'm Jarrell, and I'm so glad you decided to spend your Sunday morning with us. If this is your first time here, Pastor Mike would like to meet with you outside the north doorway after service, where you will receive your favorite soda, candy bar, and a gift. Before we get started with worship, here's some of the things happening at First Baptist Aztec. Tuesday, from 5.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., we will have our Tuesday time of prayer in the worship center. Join us, even if it is only for a few minutes, as we seek the Father for a spiritual renewal in the region, for God to draw His people from the north, south, east, and west to Himself, and for people to discover hope and healing and a church to call home. Our revival will continue through Wednesday, starting with the meal at 5.15 p.m. and the service starting at 6.30 p.m. You do not want to miss this. Your friends don't want to miss this. So invite them to join you. Ladies, join us for If Aztec, April 1st and 2nd, right here at First Baptist Church Aztec. We are all trying to navigate how to live in a world where chaos, grief, and suffering are the norm. We're weary and a lot of days we don't know how to put one foot in front of the other. So let's gather together and talk about how to live and be holy in these days. Sign up today with Crystal. The cost is $20 per person. Join us for fun games and food on April 3rd at 5 p.m. We'll have games for all ages, along with food and fellowship. You don't want to miss it. Saturday, April 9th at 5 p.m., Mike Tabbitt will lead us through a teaching Seder. Mike will teach from God's Word about actual biblical and historical events that will lead us to celebrate and remember the upper room and what the modern Passover table looks like. Each family that signs up will be given a simple recipe to follow, prepare, and to share during the Seder. This is a family event, and child care will be provided for nursery to third grade age. Today is the last day to sign up in the First Cafe or on the website at firstaztec.org forward slash Seder. There will be a meeting for all ministry team leaders on April 10th at 12.30 p.m., to start planning for the Summer Sizzle Spectacular. At 3.30 p.m., there will be a meeting for all the volunteers helping with the event. That's it for this week's announcements. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week online at firstaztec.org and on social media. We believe God has something to say to you, and our hope is that you will feel His love stronger than ever before. You picked a great day to be here, and welcome home. Are you sure? I don't have a joke, but I do have a question. Here's the question. How do you keep a room full of God's wonderful servants in suspense? I'll tell you next time. Well, ladies and gentlemen, he's here all weekend. Be sure and try the veal and don't forget to tip your waitress. Oh, all right. Hi, my name's Rick. I'm here to worship God with you. Let's do that. Will you stand with us, please? song for some of you, but it's a great one. You're going to like it. Can we get words? We might. It's one of those days, church. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is 
Have a seat, if you would, please, and direct your attention to Pastor Mike. What a wonderful song. Wow. I love the words, love the meaning behind those words, the relationship that that explains that we can all have in Christ. Powerful. Today, 
we get to celebrate two baptisms. Now, I want to make certain that you understand why, uh, why people are baptized. Because some of you, this may be your very first time to see a baptism, or maybe it's never been explained to you. So baptism, first, I want to tell you what it doesn't do. Baptism does not remove our sins. That's right. Baptism does not bring Jesus into our lives. Baptism does not get anyone to heaven. All right? Let me tell you what baptism does do. Baptism brings people into obedience with the Father because it's commanded in Scripture. Baptism is basically an act of surrender. It's a picture of what that person has already done in their lives. In other words, when someone turns away from their sins and they turn to Jesus and they say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you the rest of my life. I know I'm not going to be perfect, but I'm going to strive to live for you the rest of my life without shame and without fear. Save me, forgive me, be the boss, the king, the master of my life. Baptism is a picture of that because you see when that person stands in the water to be baptized, it is a picture of them dying spiritually to an old way of life. When they go under the water, the Bible tells us it's a picture of them being spiritually buried. And when they come out of the water, it's a picture of them being raised to live in a brand new life. So that's what baptism is. That's why we baptize. So this morning, it's my pleasure to ask Kelly to join me in these baptismal waters. It is warm, isn't it? Absolutely. Give it up. All right. Come forward for me. You're awesome. There you go. Trust me. I'm a trained professional. All right. All right. Kelly, let me ask you a couple of questions. All right. Have you asked Jesus to come into your life? Have you turned away from your sins and you've turned to Jesus and you've asked him to save you yes. and to forgive you yes. and to be the boss, the king of your life, right? Yes. Awesome. Awesome. How old are you? 15. 15 years old. Awesome. <coughs> Proud of you. Many people don't know you. That's why I'm just giving them a perspective, all right? Because they're going to be getting to know you more and I would just want to help there. So Kelly, it is upon your profession of faith that I have the pleasure of baptizing you, my sister in Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, and raised to walk in a brand new life. Good job. Good job. Matt, come on down, my friend. It is warm, isn't it? All right. Different view from here. It is. It is. It is, it is. So my friends, this is Matt. Many of you know Matt. Um, Hi, Matt. Hi, Matt. Hi, Matt. Guys, this view is incredible. I was just, just saying. It is. Yeah. It is. No, it is incredible. The reason Matt stands in these waters today with me is he, he's, had, he's been on a journey with Christ, as we all are. And... Yes, he had been baptized when he was younger, when he had an experience with Christ. But as he said to me, you know, Pastor, I actually had a life-changing experience. I gave my life to Christ last July. And so he's been on this pilgrimage. He's been on this journey. And so today he becomes obedient in following Christ in baptism. So let me ask you a couple of questions, my friend. Mm -hmm. Have you asked Jesus to come into your life? Absolutely. If you ask him to save you and forgive you the wrong things that you've done. God help me, yes. And you've, he, you know that he is the boss of your life and you're going to follow him the rest of your life without shame and without fear. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. It is upon your profession of faith that I have the pleasure of baptizing you, my brother in Christ, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in a brand new life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You. Love you. I told him David Knight gave me $10 to hold him down longer, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah. The father appreciates humor, I'm just saying. He made you, so it's a... You know, baptism is a glorious thing. It really is. It's an act of surrender. And that's what Matt said 
to me yesterday at the men's retreat. He said, I just need to surrender this to the Father. So let me ask you a question. A question that we ask at the end of every baptism service. And I believe it's a valid question and one that the Father wants us to ask. And that is, who will be next? Who, who will be next to turn away from their sins and turn to Christ like Kelly did? Who will be next to get their baptism on the right side of their salvation like Matt just did? Is it you sitting here today? If it is, I, I, I pray that you're next. Set all the excuses aside and surrender to the God and go, God, I surrender it. It's yours. I am yours. Maybe you've got all that settled, but maybe God is bringing someone into your life that you get to share Jesus with this week. Maybe even today. And you get to share the truth of the gospel of how you were saved and how they can be saved just like you were because you're no better than they are. We're just, some have found grace and some have not yet found grace. So who will be next? Would you take this question with me to the Father? Because when one pray, who prays? We all pray. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, we do celebrate with Kelly and with Matt. Father, thank you for this act of surrendering to you and receiving the, the gift of salvation and then following that with baptism. Thank you and hallelujah. Father, we pray that for their continued discipleship, that you would use us in their lives. The Father, our hearts now turn and ask you the question of who will be next. Is it us, one of us sitting here? Is it several of us sitting here in this room? Do we go, yeah, I need to ask Christ into my life. I need to do what Kelly did. Or I need to do what Matt did. Get my baptism on the right side of my salvation. But Father, maybe it's someone that we see you bring into our lives. And we set aside the intimidation, we set aside the fear, and we speak truth and love. Not as one better than anyone else, but as one saved and called to share truth and love. Oh, Father, we wait with expectation to see who will be next. Maybe that baptism will even happen tonight. Oh, Father, make it so for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, leading us in worship this morning and through Wednesday night is Rick Britton. He's a friend of mine. Uh, really appreciate him being here. He was here and led us uh, in, in preaching not too many weeks ago. Jim Burkett, you've met him. Many of you have met him in 2019. He came and shared with us then. I am so honored to have him back and to share the pulpit with him this morning, tonight, through Wednesday night. Uh, you be praying for these two men as they continue to lead us this week. All right? Thank you. God bless. Good morning. Good morning. Wow. Feels like we've already been to church this morning, doesn't it? <laughs> it hang on. It gets better. <laughs> if, if it can get better. It's better, right? <laughs> okay. So I'm going to read from the book of Psalms in Psalm 1 this morning, if you want to look that up. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, right. nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits you, in the seat of the scornful. You, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and Thanks. in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in, ju in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And I had told him earlier that I feel like this kind of ends on a negative note. 
And I don't like to leave things on a negative note. It says, by the way, the ungodly shall perish. If you're in that condition, you don't have to be. Amen. You can be in the condition of the blessed man who, who follows God's laws and meditates in them. And our prayer today is that today be your day of salvation. All right, I had something. I said I had to tell Jarrell. <laughs> we have a class. What do you teach us? Discipleship. And in that class, it says, he is the vine, we are the branches. What's the last part, Jarrell? We will bear much fruit. Right. All right, this week, or well, before this, I've been talking to some people in here. We've been praying for a guy named Arnufo. Remember that? Guess what? Come on. He's a child of God. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. If you ain't taking that class, you need that class. It's our job to be witnesses and to lead people to Christ. Somebody led you. If you aren't, today's the day of salvation is what the Bible tells us. So we're going to lift up God this morning and we're going to praise him. And hopefully, if you're not saved today, you won't leave this door without him. Our Heavenly Father, as we come before you, Lord, Lord, it's such an awesome, awesome day to enter into the house of the living God. We thank you for the blessings that you constantly bestow upon us. Lord, we're thankful for the opportunities to see lives changed and hearts turned toward you. Lord, we ask that you make us, there's so many men in the Bible, hmm. like Moses, who led people out of captivity. Help us to be the ones that show people how to get out of their sinful ways. Turn to you. Lord, help us to be like Joshua and Caleb. Yeah. The faith that they showed, that they led people into the promised land. And once they got there, the battles that were there, you overcame. Lord, we ask that you help us to be like Elisha, who got to see your spirit just come down and lap up the offering that was given. Amen. Lord, we ask that your presence be in this building today, that it comes down and each and every one of us see it. Lord, that the hearts would be touched. Lord, that the burdens that we have be lifted. Lord, help us to be great servants. Help us to give our utter beings over to you, that through you, things will be made awesome. We ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, stand with us, please, if you would. This is a song, just like Kelly and Matt declared over in the baptistry. We're all going to declare true things about the Savior while we sing this, okay?
Go ahead, guys. Go ahead. You sound like you meant that. Amen. Let's continue praising. This is this is the response to who He is. What we're gonna do. the everlasting God, the creator of the whole earth. He never grows weary or tired. There is no limit to his understanding and he gives strength to the weary. To those who lack might, he gives power. Though youths grow weary and tired and strong young men stumble badly, they who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up on wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not faint. Wow. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. 
strength arises, we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign It's all good. It's all good. Because of him. Not because of me. Not because of what I know and what I can do. But because he is good. He is faithful. He is strong enough. It's all good. Grand earth has quaked before. The sound of his voice Seas that are shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken for my regard And through it all, through it all My eyes are on you Through it all, through it all it is
only well with us because of who you are. We can only think right and believe right and live right because of your spirit living in us. And we need help. We need to learn. We need to understand. We need to know. So as we come now to the time of a man of God coming to instruct us in your word because of what you've taught him, make us learners and livers and believers and knowers of what is true about you. Bless my brother Jim as he comes now. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior, for your glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. All right, I said this in the uh, early service, and, and I really meant it. And uh, now I can say it again in the second service because I really meant it. Uh, boy, you have a great worship team. Yes, we do. You really do. And there's so many uh, churches that would love to have what you have. I mean, just to be able to worship the Lord and, and, uh, and a flow, and it's not... It's not not, not trying to be professionalism, it is the, the idea that this is just the overflow of their love and commitment to the Lord Jesus and, and to you. So it is a joy to be uh, back with you. Uh, uh, you know, I think I was here pre-COVID days before we even knew what COVID was, and uh, we had a great time. My wife, uh, Pam, she is praying and fasting uh, for this meeting, praying and fasting for you. And uh, she anticipates that God is uh, speaking to a lot of special folks in a most significant way. And uh, uh, so thank the Lord for Pastor Mike. Uh, there's so many good things I could say about him. I'll leave the bad things later. But, uh, but I'm serious. When I think of evangelism and I think of someone that embodies and exhibits that gifting, it's this man. And also uh, a caring pastor. I tell you what, it's been interesting to watch him. Uh, I remember um, uh, at a meeting we had in Oklahoma, and, um, and I was a, uh, to lead a breakout session, and then he and I went to a restaurant afterwards, and, and I tell you what, uh, he had already built relationships with uh, waitresses in this one restaurant, and uh, I mean, they smiled when they saw him and everything else, and uh, there was one I don't think he had really had a chance to witness to, and whoosh, there comes that Evangel Cube, you know, and, uh, and, and listen. And I could tell she understood uh, that he was uh, very uh, serious and, and very caring. And the rest of your staff, my goodness, praise God for you guys. And I just uh, really believe God's going to do some extraordinary things. And then your youth pastor, oh my goodness, Kima Sabi Kaibunga. I tell you what, this guy has a heart to learn and a heart to serve the Lord. And so I'm very excited about that. And, and then I met his bride. I tell you what, uh, God, yes, yes. Like me, like me. So anyway, well, you've heard me say this before, and, and I'm, I'm going to try to fashion this and fold this because I believe the Lord's uh, uh, given me some new instruction for this service. Three things I pray when I come before a church or a, a, a breakout session or a conference, whatever. First thing I pray is that God will give you biblical truths that will impact your thinking. Now, I want you to listen to me on this. This is crucial. A lot of times we think if we just know concepts and know, knows words, uh, that can be all right if they change your thinking by the Holy Spirit. But the Apostle Paul put it this way. Uh, he said in Romans uh, uh, 8, 5, He who sets his mind on the things of the flesh will walk according to the flesh, but the, he who sets his mind on the things of the Spirit will walk according to the Spirit. And this is so vital. My wife's husband has this little saying, and it goes something like this. You must think like a Christian in order to believe like a Christian, in order to behave like a Christian, in order to do God's will. Let me repeat that. You must think like a Christian, in order to believe like a Christian, in order to behave like a Christian, in order to do God's will. And so many times, we, particularly in America, we think, well, if we know the vocabulary, or we, if we've been to a situation and we kind of know the meaning of the words, and that's not what uh, uh, Romans 8, 5 is talking about. It's really talking about that change takes place because your mind is not in spiritually neutral. You're beginning to saturate your mind with biblical truth. Um, so with that in mind, uh, that's why God created us to think, to think his thoughts. 
He said to the Corinthians, we have the mind of Christ. He said to the Colossians, set your mind, uh, said to the Colossians, uh, think on these things. He said to Paul, uh, he, I'm sorry, Paul said to uh, Timothy, he said, for the spirit of the Lord is not of fear, but love power and a self-disciplined mind. So that's why I pray God will change your thinking. No matter how bad the situation is, God will change your thinking. And uh, I'm fortunate in the fact that I've seen uh, God do some miraculous things. 34 years as a pastor in university settings. I've been teaching in colleges and universities for the past, past 25 years. And it excites me to see that the power of God, God can change the most unlikely situations. So I, I, I just want you to know, I really believe God wants to do that this morning too. I, so I don't care how old you are. Don't care what your situation is. God wants to minister in and through you. My background is, uh, I'm sharing with you why it takes more faith to doubt the Bible than to trust the Bible today. And I believe you're going to be stirred because you're, I believe you're going to say, oh my goodness, uh, the Bible's really true. Christianity is really true. And I really believe it can impact your thinking and your perspective when you realize God has given a special word to all of us, uh, especially through Jesus Christ, and then verified in propositional statements that we have in the Word of God. Well, my background is I didn't grow up in a Christian family. Grew up in a good family. My dad was a World War II hero. Um, he liked to fish before, uh, in fact, before I met the Lord, uh, uh, every, uh, every Saturday and Sunday we went fishing. He was big bass burkett. I was a little bass burkett. And, and uh, uh, then in the seventh grade, I discovered girls and football and that kind of, uh, you know, messed up my fishing uh, career. But then in the ninth grade, because you see, my desire in the ninth grade was to go to Will Rogers High School, which is a few blocks from my house, uh, and then go to college, go to University of Oklahoma, play football for Bud Wilkerson. You know, if you remember him, he's, he st his team still hold the records for 47 straight uh, consecutive wins. Still hasn't been beaten in all these years. Uh, and then get a degree in engineering and law. But God had other plans. And uh, I tell you what, uh, it just amazed me. So here I am, ninth grade, I'm getting ready to watch my favorite show, Gunsmoke. I mean, you remember Matt Dillon? I mean, we're talking about uh, Miss Kitty, we're talking about uh, Chester, we're talking about Doc. And so I'm getting ready to watch Gunsmoke on Saturday night. And my mother comes in and she does the unthinkable. Uh, she was bigger than I was at the time, so we had to do what she had wanted to do. She turns it from, from uh, Gunsmoke to this TV evangelist named Billy Graham. And I'm thinking, he can't even draw fast or shoot straight. So nonetheless, uh, I went ahead and I watched, the, watched the, you know, Billy Graham for a while. And then the phone rang. And I knew if the phone was for my mother, I had 15 minutes because she had the gift of you understand what I'm talking about. So when she goes to answer the phone, and we're talking about the days when every family had one phone hooked by a wire into the wall. Now, I start out with rotary, okay? I don't know if you're that old or if you even know what that means. But nonetheless, so uh, our phone was in the, uh, in the uh, hallway. So when she goes to answer the phone, I, I trip back, uh, not trip, but I, I uh, take a tour uh, up to the TV and change it from Billy Graham to uh, Gunsmoke. Uh, a miracle happened. Mom only talked two minutes, came back in, and uh, d didn't even ask to, us to vote on it, but she just went up and changed it right back to Billy Graham. First time I have ever heard the gospel outright. Now, I have been to church before. My grandmother went to one church, and I occasionally would go to her, go with her, and uh, nothing, nothing personal against her church, but it just seemed like it was, you know, two levels above a funeral service. Have you been in a church like that? Okay. And so, uh, uh, nonetheless, I just said to the Lord, Lord, I'll wait till I'm really old, uh, like 20 or 21, uh, before I find out if you're real. And uh, this was the ninth grade. And not only that, but I had dreams of going to Will Rogers High School. Like I said, I wanted to be a football hero. I wanted to, I wanted to do so well in football that I could walk down the hallways of Will Rogers, 10 girls on each arm, the rest of the girls lined up singing, How Great Thou Art. So... <laughs> Any, any of you men have those same kind of prayers and aspirations? Yeah, I, I see. Okay. All right. Hey, we got some honest guys in the church. Hallelujah. All right. So uh, long story short, I'm listening to Billy Graham. I know it's the Holy Spirit. If you remember him in his young days, he gets to the conclusion of his message. And this is when, this is when his ministry could literally rent an entire network and be on every station of that network in the United States. 
And when he got to the conclusion of his message, he looked into the camera and he said, uh, you could be at a bar, you could be at home, you could be a motel, but if you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you would like to uh, have uh, forgiveness of sins, then pray this prayer after me. So I bowed my head, I prayed the prayer. Uh, I wish I could say that, you know, I had the thrill, the feel. No, didn't have that. Uh, I wish I could say that I heard the angels singing the hallelujah, hallelujah chorus. I didn't, I didn't hear that. But one thing I can tell you is, I knew something was different. So, so fast forward, God really shocks me. Uh, he calls me into the ministry when I'm a senior in high school. I couldn't believe it. I think Gabriel was surprised too. So here I am. I, I, I go into the ministry. I go to our denominational uh, university in Oklahoma. And, and what I'm about to share with you is not, is not uh, uh, running anybody down. It's just that uh, uh, I'm not complaining. I'm just explaining. Okay. So uh, because now I can really, without any hesitation, recommend my alma mater. Uh, I mean, they, they, uh, they're doing so many superb things. They even had courses on apologetics and a minor in apologetics, which they didn't have that back then. But nonetheless, here we are. It's the, it's the, it's the latter part of the 60s. By 1968, as a result of the influence of two, three professors, uh, even though I was preaching every weekend, I got to the place where I didn't know if God existed or not. I mean, and here I'm a the theological major. I mean, uh, I don't know about you, but that's kind of a bad thing if you're going to go into the ministry, right? And so uh, uh, I knew that I couldn't go on this way, and so I prayed the agnostic's prayer. You know what an agnostic is? Someone that says God may exist or He may not exist. So uh, man, I just knew I had to get this right. It's like Josh Medow says, the heart cannot rejoice in what the mind doubts. So I had to get this settled. You know, in other words, this is March of 1968. If I didn't get this settled by the end of the semester, hey, I'm changing my major. I'm changing to another, uh, uh, to another university altogether. So I prayed, uh, God, if you're there. Uh, I didn't know if I was, I don't know if I'm just talking to air. But if you're really there, I need an intellectual state. I need a shun, something that is immovable and that I know that I know that you exist and Jesus is your son. So I prayed that prayer, really meant it. Uh, two nights later, I had, uh, I had, uh, I went to the, uh, the university library and I went to the university library two nights later because I had a term paper due the next morning and I thought I should start on it. So <laughs> do any of you have to get to procrastination? Okay. We got a workshop here. I see, I see several that will help me lead it here, right here in the front. So that's good. So here I am. I'm in the library and I'm going through and I'm going through the periodical section. I look at all these magazines and my procrastination gift kicks in and I see this one magazine says Christianity Today. And so I take it off and I sit down. I, I think, well, I wonder what, what the main story is. I open it up. The very first article is entitled uh, The Historical Evidence for the Resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I thought, Oh, it's written by a pastor, it's written by a theologian, or it's written by a, a missionary, and I was stunned. It wasn't written by a pastor, it wasn't written by a theologian, it wasn't written by, uh, you know, a, a, a missionary. It was written by the dean of the law college at the University of London, who was also the director for advanced legal studies, who was also considered one of the world's leading scholars on evidence. Then I found out it was not even a magazine article. It was the transcription of an address he gave to the Harvard University Christian Fellowship. I mean, it blew me away. So here's what the Dr. Anson said. He said, I'm going to act like an attorney, and we're going to look at the betrayal, the trial, uh, the crucifixion, and the purported resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And then we're just going to follow the evidence. We're going to look at the legal evidence and the, all the other evidences, and we, we will see where it leads. And about the next to the last paragraph, Dr. Anson basically comes to this point, and he makes this statement. He said, on the basis of evidence and evidence alone, the only conclusion that any rational person can come to is that somehow, some way, Jesus of Nazareth came back from the dead in history. And when I read that, it was sort of like a shung, that intellectual stake was, was driven. Now, that's when I discovered apologetics. Now what is apologetics? Apologetics does not mean going up to someone and just saying, would you please forgive me? I believe in God and I'm a follower of Jesus. That's not what it means. Apologetics is basically a technical word based on a Greek word called apologia. It means giving rational reasons why you believe what you believe. Some call it defending the faith. I take it, I believe that that needs to be enhanced because God wants you to have an apologetics mindset. So that's what we're going to look at this morning as we look at why it takes more faith to doubt the Bible than to trust the Bible. Now, why am I doing that? Just real quick, I want to tell you something. Church, 
if I'm sure you're aware of it, we can no longer sit on the sidelines and let our young people be swept away from moral falsehoods uh, as it relates to Jesus Christ, Christianity, and what makes a wholesome life. Uh, the surveys, I've read 25, 30 of them. Um, basically, the number one reason why we're losing 50% of church young people, you ready for this? It's not because, uh, uh, you know, the guy says, well, I broke up with my girlfriend, I don't want to go to church anymore. It's not because, uh, uh, it's not the color of the carpet, it's not this, it's not that. The number one reason is they, uh, young people in church, come to the conclusion that Christianity is not true, God doesn't exist, and Jesus is not who He claims to be. Where do they get that idea? Here's what would happen. They would go to their church leaders and they'd say, what about Christianity as it relates to uh, this scientific discovery or this historical perspective or this cultural phenomena? And basically church leaders have not been trained in this and they would say something like, well, you know, I don't know what to tell you, but just have faith. That's the wrong thing to say. The Bible does not teach uh, to teach blind faith. And uh, I was sharing this with a group of pastors and youth pastors in Oklahoma uh, at the Evangelism Conference. And, and you could just, as I quoted all these, all these stats, you could just see them slouching in their chairs. And finally I said, how many of you would like to hear some good news? And uh, several of them said, please, please give us some good news. And I was able to share with them a couple of, a couple of surveys. Was that me? Okay, praise the Lord. It's not my stomach growling. Uh, so anyway... <laughs> So uh, I was able to share with them some stats. Uh, a, one survey indicated that those churches where the church leaders know the gravity of what our young people and what we're facing at large in our culture, it is a spiritual war. That is no exaggeration. I could give you some stats on it, but this is not the place. And, uh, but when they understand the gravity of it, and they, and they train their young people to think logically through a biblical worldview based on the facts of apologetics, 90% will go on with God. That was a... I, thank you. Who said a hallelujah? Okay. God bless you, brother. All right. May your tribe increase. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is we've got to focus on, on what God always intended does that make sense? That we equip our young people. So, well, well I, I, was taught, I was taught in church, well, you've got to define what you mean by teaching. If you mean just giving concepts, sorry, that won't do it. To be trained, equipped means you know how to respond in a certain situation because you see the factuality of it. Does that make sense? Okay, well, we better go on because I could break out in song any time now, and you don't want that. Next frame, please. All right. Acts 1-3. Um, to, to them also he showed himself alive by a series of many convincing demonstrations, unquestionable evidences, and infallible proofs appearing to them during 40 days. The he is Jesus. Now I want you to be aware of something. You see that phrase, many convincing demonstrations? Most of the time evangelicals, when they get to the book of Acts, they go straight to a beeline to verse 8, which talks about, uh, you know, uh, uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit, which by, by all means, that's a key verse. But I believe there's a more important verse, and that's verse 3, where it says, He showed Himself alive by a series of many convincing demonstrations. That, that, those two words in the Greek uh, are tekmerios. What is tekmerios? Tekmerios always means well, if there's a report that's being given, if there is a, a testimony that's being shared, uh, if there is evidence that's being presented, it always means that the evidence and the report will always show that it's true and accurate. In other words, Jesus for 40 days was showing them, hey, it's me. I've come back from the dead. This is not a not a special supernatural kind of awareness. It's the same kind of perception you would have if you were there. Same kind of perception like here, the, the good looking guy sitting right here. Okay. I mean, I can see this guy's really handsome. I thought you'd say amen. Okay. <laughs> this guy's really handsome. Okay. In other words, but I didn't have a special kind of awareness. It's the same thing. No special kind of awareness. You see the evidence and you come to the proper conclusion. All right. Next frame, please. And we're going to speed up on some of these. The four big questions, if you can answer these questions in the positive, then you will always have a good, stable, solid spiritual life that you can build on. Number one, does truth exist? This is really big. I'm telling you what, um, in 2016, the Oxford University Dictionary said the word of the year is post-truth. 
My definition is a, as a uh, not my definition, but the explanation of the definition is basically post-truth means coming to conclusions based on ra uh, on uh, emotional impressions. I want to tell you that's not truth as defined by the Bible or scientist. Uh, what's important is uh, there is the truth which is subjective. Oh, you have your truth, I have my truth. I want to tell you something. You may think that's you may think that's a cool statement, but it's it's not factually true. Uh, if somebody says that, you might ask them, how do you know that's true? Here's what the Bible teaches and what scientists will, will uh, go to. And that is objective truth. Objective truth. Objective truth means what matches reality. Now, now, now I know you're looking at me and you're, you're saying, well, why would you say that? You can't do science without objective truth. Did you hear me? You can't do engineering without objective truth. You can't do technology without objective truth. And you certainly cannot do proper medicine without objective truth, which means you cannot change the definitions of uh, certain aspects of uh, homo sapiens as well as uh, uh, others. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make a statement. I'm not trying to be controversial, and, and, and I really mean that. It's just by means, uh, by means of illustration. But there's something seriously wrong in our culture. Uh, Francis Schaeffer wrote a little book years ago called Escape from Reason. And he said there's something dangerous when our culture, uh, even in educational centers, do not just stick to what is brute truth is what he called it. So when we have a Supreme Court nominee who says that uh, she cannot uh, give a definition of what a female is or what a woman is uh, because she's not a biologist, uh, that's... Anyway... Uh... I want to give all of them a scholarship to uh, the Oklahoma School of Apologetics. So anyway, if you hear about it, you might pray about it. Now, but does truth exist? Yes, truth exists. Why is this important? Because we can know that Christianity is based upon truth. It's called the household of truth. We move on. Does God exist? Oh, brothers and sisters, I'm telling you what. I have a whole course entitled How God Uses Science to Confirm His Existence. There are, there are so many uh, scientific affirmations. I mentioned Dr. James Tour, the world world's leading nanotechnologist. Uh, he has, has over a hundred patents. Uh, this guy holds three professorships at Rice University. I had the chance of seeing him. He's a Messianic Jew too. Uh, I had the chance of hearing him at Tulsa University. And I tell you what, I've never heard anyone uh, from a scientific perspective give as, as good a presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was just really remarkable. He says things like this. You ready? He says, and by the way, he's considered the leader in the world in his subject. And he said, uh, I need to tell you this. When I go to these big conferences and they, and they feature the, the leading names in biology and biochemistry, he said, I know them. They know me. And so when it's just me and someone else and we're in the green room and we're waiting to go out and speak. And when there's nobody else there, we're off cameras. I, I, I will look to, I will look to uh, my, my colleague and I'll say, let me ask you something. Uh, can you tell me, and, and I'm just asking, but can you tell me, is there any scientific evidence that demonstrates how an inanimate object evolves into an animate object? He said, every one of them will say, 50% of them will say, no, I've never seen or heard of anything. Another 25% won't say anything, and another 25% will say, I just don't know what to tell you. Not one has said, I can show you the evidence. And that's why there's a growing number of scientists that are saying all the scientific evidence seems to indicate there is a creator. I mean, it's massive. I, listen, I could give you five examples just, just like this, but uh, we need to go on because I don't want you to miss the jokes that are coming up. So anyway, all right, number, number three, do miracles happen? And, and there's a problem here because there's a lot of people, they go to church and they think, well, uh, you know, this can't be the God of the Bible because, uh, you know, they, uh, they're not sure God would intervene in anything. And I want to tell you something. If, the, if Christianity is not supernatural, it's not Christianity. I mean, the first big miracle is that God created a universe out of nothing. And not only that, but um, here's a dead man. He comes back from the dead. And, uh, you know, uh, you can't do that in the laboratory. And so here he is, and he makes decorations, and he fulfills prophecy that's just overwhelming. And uh, uh, we'll talk about, uh, talk about that later this week. Do miracles happen? Great book. Uh, do, uh, 
The Case for Miracles by Lee Strobel, very excellent. Uh, even shows uh, some examples you might need to be aware of. Uh, John R. Rice, if you are from a fundamentalist background, his book, Prayer, Asking, Receiving, two chapters on miracles, two chapters on healing. Uh, when I was a pastor, I would give, uh, give a copy of that book to every deacon because I wanted them to know when we pray, something happens. God can change things. And so that's why we saw, uh, saw God, to, uh, not only physically, but marriages saved and churches turned around and, and, uh, and businesses uh, that were turned around. And then number four, is the Bible historically reliable? Oh, you're getting ready to see that, and I think you're going to be very excited about it. And I give you permission now, just, just, just go ahead and get ready to say amen, okay? Just giving you permission, <laughs> giving a heads up. All right, let's go to the next frame. Um, what is New Testament faith? I'm only going to use one of these. New Testament faith, out there, they, when they say faith, they define faith. Even, even one of the four horsemen of atheism. Oh, my goodness. I can't tell you how many Christians just thought, this guy needs to study. And, I, and they weren't being mean. But he thinks faith is defined as wishful thinking. That's not faith. That's not faith. New Testament faith is evidence-based. I'll give you one example here. Uh, John 7. Here we have the disciples of uh, John the Baptist. And uh, so John the Baptist, is, he, he is a, he's standing, standing for traditional marriage, uh, and he's in prison for it. And so he tells two of his, uh, two of his uh, messengers, go and ask Jesus, are you the one that we look to, or do we look to someone else? So the messengers go to Jesus, and uh, Jesus, uh, uh, they, they say, John the Baptist wants to know, are you the one we look to, or do we look to someone else? I want to, I want to tell you what Jesus did not say which could be just as significant as what he did say. Jesus did not say, well, you go back and tell John just to pull, just pull up his faith bootstraps, and you know, he'll be all right. No, it's very interesting what Jesus said. Jesus said, you go back and you tell John what you have seen and heard. You tell him the blind see. Is that verifiable? You tell him that the lame walk, is that verifiable? You tell him the deaf can hear, is that verifiable? The dead are raised. I think that's really big time verifiable. So when we talk about faith, we're talking about evidence-based. Now, you need to come to some of these, uh, these uh, uh, presentations we have this week because we'll go in a lot more detail on some of these. Next frame, please. All right, key points about the trustworthiness of the Christian Scripture. Next frame. Uh, we're going to look at these key points, and then we're coming right into uh, the, 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 uh, the um, home stretch. Number one, the Bible does not have a mythical literary style as compared with other ancient literature. In, in, in the college setting, <clears throat> if I've heard it once, I've heard it so many times. Here's a grad student said, boy, Jim, <clears throat> I wish I could, I, I wish I could uh, have faith like you, but I've just got to go by facts. And whenever he says that, I know he doesn't know what faith is. He does not know. And, and, and then I'll hear him say, well, the Bible's filled with so, so many mythological concepts. How in the world can you believe in the Bible? They've got a big problem. And one is they don't know the definition of mythology. Mythology, in, in our culture, you say mythology and it means you're telling a story that either does not have a historical basis or it do, is not historically accurate. Uh, there's nine definitions for the word mythology. In our culture, <clears throat> as I just mentioned, it means it's, it's usually a story that is made up or it's a fable or it's a distortion. Now, here's what's interesting. When we say the Bible does not have mythology, we mean that it can be uh, factually and historically verified. How many of you have heard of C.S. Lewis? Was he a pretty smart guy? He was, wasn't he? And uh, uh, C.S. Lewis was asked, well, what do you think about mythology in the Bible? Here's basically what he said. He said, listen, uh, I have studied mythology and romance literature all my adult life. And I want to tell you that when I read the New Testament, what I read there does not have the characteristics of the mythology, but it has all the characteristics of eyewitness accounts. There's a big difference, a very big difference. All right, next. The Bible is not a science text, but describes the world as it appears to the naked eye. And we've got to understand that. Uh, a lot of people that say uh, the Bible has a lot of scientific uh, uh, false informations, um, again, they really need to study. There's four, four lines of reasoning you can have about Scripture and science. 
Uh, I believe the Bible teaches that there's no contradiction between science and Scripture. And by the way, there are hundreds of scientists who would hold to the same position. What do you mean by that? Well, for example, science as a, as a precise discipline really did not begin to take place until about four or five hundred years ago. And uh, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of Michael Gillum. He wrote a book called Amazing Truths, how, how the Bible and science agree. Now, who is he? Well, PhD in physics from Harvard, used to teach physics at Harvard. He was also the ABC News science editor for many years. And when he wrote this book, he said, yes, there are, there are men of science who have contradictions, but it's a worldview issue, a belief issue, not factual. When you talk about true science and talk about biblical uh, truth, uh, there are no contradictions. Again, we'll be uh, uh, referring to that later. Next frame, please. All right. Varying accounts are not the same as contradictory accounts. Oh, there's so many contradictions in the Bible. Got to define what you mean by a contradiction. Listen, listen, here's a contradiction. The 28 year old woman said, I'm pregnant but I'm really not pregnant. Okay, how many mothers know that that's a contradiction? Oh, we have to do another workshop, Pastor. Okay, all right. So that is a contradiction. I could give you more examples. But what's a varying account? A varying account is uh, there are reports of the same event, but from a different perspective. Matthew was a Jew writing to Jews. That's why you see more Old Testament prophecies. Mark was uh, in Rome. He was uh, writing down uh, the, the, the sermons of uh, Simon Peter. And, uh, and the theme is uh, the servant of the Lord uh, uh, ministering in the power of the Lord. Uh, Forty-eight times he says, straight away Jesus did this, straight away Jesus did that, and so on and so forth. And then you got Luke. Many believe that he's probably one of the best um, historians of the first century. And uh, I mean, he gives more, the titles and names of more cities and uh, and uh, uh, currents and in the sea and so on and so forth than any other writer from the first century. And yet you can tell this guy is a scholar. Uh, then we have the Gospel of John, which gives the grand Logos concepts and so forth. Uh, talking about the same situation, but from a different perspective. So some of you, I understand, have a law enforcement background. And if you had to deal with, a, with an accident, let's say there's five cars in the accident, you, you, you will interview every one of the drivers, but you'll find out every driver has a different perspective. It's different for the guy in the back uh, of the tailgating as opposed to the first car in the pile of five cars. So there are no contradictions, just variants. Oh, modern historical research as to biblical credibility. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Just archaeology alone. I want to tell you something. The archaeologists, I'm talking about both Jewish and Christian, they will tell you, now listen to me on this, there has never ever been an archaeological discovery that has contradicted the Bible. Right. Not once. On. You won't hear that in some seminaries. You won't hear that in some Bible colleges. And that's what, that's what bothers me. Uh, fake news is bad enough, but fake science is, is even worse. And so I, I just can't say this strong enough. And then when we come to manuscript evidence, it's overwhelming. Oh my goodness. But we're going to see that in just a minute. Is this making sense? Yeah. All right. Okay. Now then, let's go to the next frame, and now we come into the into the home stretch and uh, uh, manuscript comparisons. All right. Next frame. Um, you've probably heard of Julius Caesar. Uh, he wrote the Gallic Wars about to 55 BC. I want you to notice. Now, now look at this. We're talking about the comparison between the original and the earliest copy. The earliest copy we have today was written about 900 A.D., a time span of 1,000 years. There's 231 copies. Uh, Plato uh, wrote during the Golden Age of Greece. Uh, time frame between the earliest copy and the original is 1,200 years. Uh, 238 copies. Let's drop down to Aristotle. Wrote during the Golden Age of Greece. Notice earliest copies dated 1,100 A.D. Uh, we have a time frame of 1,400 years. We only have 49 copies uh, of his writings. Then when we get to Homer, how many of you had to read uh, the Iliad in uh, high school? Homer, okay, you loved it, didn't you? You know, you, you wanted to give it uh, as a Christmas present to some of your worst friends. Uh, anyway, uh, Homer wrote the Iliad about 900 B.C. Earliest copy dated 400 B.C. Time gap of 500 years. We've only been able to find uh, scraps and parchments of uh, 1900. But now we come to the New Testament. 
I, I, I mean, if Michelle was at the drums, we'd have her do a little, you know, drum roll, because when it comes to the New Testament, I'm telling you what, it's absolutely amazing. There is no, there is no document from ancient history that comes close. Uh, it used to be, we would say, there's 24,970 copies of the New Testament. Uh, I'm not sure what it is. Some are saying it's getting close to 30,000. Um, now, how significant is that? Well, I want you to look when, when we're, we're, we're discovering that the entire New Testament was written uh, between uh, the time Jesus uh, went into heaven. All right. Okay. Before I was a Christian, I won two twist contests. I just want you to know that. Okay. All right. So anyway, so now... The, con the, the growing consensus is the entire New Testament, including the book of Revelation, was written no later than 70 A.D. That is astounding. That's absolutely astounding. Uh, so uh, why is this so significant? Because it says there's so much evidence that the Bible is the most accurate document from ancient history. Now, to really show you this, I have a special group called uh, Poster Ministers. And I'm going to ask my poster ministers if they please come to the front very quickly. Just very quickly, come and take your place. And I think, uh, uh, okay, yeah, just get up here, okay. 500, you're right there, okay. And what, what are you? Okay, you're, you're at that end. My dad's coming, and my sister's. Okay, okay. And, I, and you are, you're 300. If you'll stand right there, 500, would you scoot on down? Okay, all right, real quick. And you're... These are the best poster ministers I've ever had. I tell you what. Okay. And um, this distinguished uh, men of wisdom, would you scoot down just a little bit more? Okay, Caesar, okay. And, and I, I want you all to see. Now, would you, would you hold up 30? Can you see? Can you see? Hold it up real high. Can you see? This is when uh, most historians say that Jesus was crucified and came back from the dead. Then we have, and would you scooch back just a little? Then we have 50 AD, all right? And then... This is a 70 A.D., and this lovely poster minister, uh, she, uh, she will tell you that uh, the New Testament was finished uh, no later than 70 A.D. Then we have 100 A.D., 200 A.D., 300 A.D. Could you scooch down just a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Oh, stop. Okay, would you sit right, I mean, st stand, don't sit. Okay, and, and don't push that over. And would you be right there? Okay, now what we have here is a human timeline. I want to show you the significance of what it means that we have so many manuscripts. I mean, we're talking about almost 30,000, some say. And uh, the more manuscripts you have, the, 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 the more likely you can tell what is the accurate rendering of the original, if that makes sense. So let's take Caesar here. Caesar never looked so good. Caesar, he wrote the Gallic Wars, uh, you know, about 55 B.C., what's the date of the earliest copy? So, Caesar, if you'd follow me, uh, is it 50? Is it 70? Is it 100 A.D.? Is it 200 A.D.? No. Is it 300 A.D.? Is it 500 A.D.? The earliest copy of the original is separated by a thousand years, and the earliest copy is dated at 900 A.D., Okay. All right. Amen. Praise the Lord. How many of you will pray for those three? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now we come to Plato. Plato, if you'll follow me. And uh, Plato, uh, his writings are in the golden age of Greece. Well, what's the earliest date of the copy? Uh, not 30, not 50, not 70, not 200. And uh, you're dancing. Don't dance. up front. Okay. All right. 300, 500. The date of the earliest copy is 900 A.D. I still want to know about Buddha. I still want to know about Muhammad. Come on, the sheets. <laughs> you guys are good. I tell you what. What about Aristotle? Uh, what's the date of the earliest copy uh, of uh, Aristotle's original? Again, is it 100 A.D.? Is it 200 A.D.? Is it 300 A.D.? Is it 500 A.D.? It's not 900 A.D. Instead, it's 1100 A.D. He's on the other side. What about Buddha? What about Muhammad? The sheet already. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about Buddha. 
It's 600 years after the death of Buddha that there's a biography or a history made of him. Do you know how, do you know how much legend can gather? Uh, your historians tell you that within two generations, legend begins to grow. So I, I'd kind of question some of the things that are said about him. Then we've got Muhammad. What about Muhammad? Uh, that varies, it seems, from decade to decade, but they're coming up with new discoveries. Now they're saying the earliest, maybe, be 150 years after his death, but somewhere between 150 to 300 years after his death. And then uh, um, what about uh, the New Testament? What about uh, we're talking about there? Well, it's very interesting. And now I'm going to ask everyone from 100 A.D. on the way to Aristotle, would you put your posters right there, Okay. And then I'm going to ask, honey, would you come this way? You change. Okay, all right. 70. All right, if you'll stand right there at the edge of the step. Okay, would you move over a little bit more? Here we go. Okay, right here, 50. All right, right here, 30. Okay. Now, this is where it gets very interesting, okay? We're going to, we need to just come to a, a close here as soon as we possibly can. You see, they're now saying that the New Testament was finished no later than 70 A.D., John Robinson, uh, Anglican bishop, uh, scholar, uh, shocked the academic world when he was challenged to look at what's the uh, earliest dating uh, that the New Testament was concluded. And he wrote a book called Redating the New Testament. He said in that book he was shocked that his professors gave the sloppiest interpretations and translations of the work. And he said on his base conclusion, because he went to the museums and libraries to look these documents up, he said the New Testament probably was finished no later than 65 uh, A.D. I don't know if you know what that means, but we're looking at, that's 35 years. Can you remember what happened to you 35 years ago? I remember when I graduated from Will Rogers High School, a class of 65, 900 in the class. And, and so as, as, as I got my diploma, I thought I heard my mother from the stands go, thank you, Jesus, he graduated, and so on and so forth. And then uh, my girlfriend at the time, before I met the lovely Miss Pam, said, Jim, let's go to the ice cream part, 15th and Harvard, and I will treat you to a nine-scoop Lapapalooza Sunday. And uh, you really remember all the important things that happen in your life, don't you? But now here's, here's what's interesting about this. I want you to take note. Jesus comes back from the dead, 30 A.D., and everything that we know, everything that we know has been written before 70 A.D. Okay, guys, thank you so much. Would you put your posters right there? Now, what does this mean? It's like what Norman Geisler said. The Bible that you have in your hands, we can say is 99.9% .9 the very same Bible as what the early church had by the time the New Testament was finished. Did, did you get that? That's very significant. And that means if you're facing insurmountable issues, that means there are promises that says God will be you, with you through those issues. The first thing that, that it means to me practically, uh, one is that God wants to use you in a most significant way. Number two, it also means you have giftings. Uh, you're not called to be a pubitator. You have a gifting that will redemptively connect with other people. I wish I could tell you so many stories where I've seen this. For example, I pastored an inner city black church in Athens, Georgia, while I taught at one of the colleges there. University of Georgia is there and uh, Truett McConnell College. And uh, so, um, no, I'm not African American, but somehow God put me in that church. And my associate pastor, uh, uh, God delivered him from crack addict, not while he was on staff, I mean before, uh, he got on staff. And, and what was interesting is to see how God would begin to take all these homes that were broken up and as they surrendered to the Lord, as they got discipled, as they learned how to think like a Christian. Uh, this is how a husband treats his wife. Matter of fact, there's one book that says, do yourself a favor, love your wife. And as women to learn, how does the Lord want me to, to reverence uh, my husband? I mean, we begin to see extraordinary things begin to happen. Does that make sense? And then, and then uh, uh, the third thing is, uh, I learned was that uh, when God grabs a hold of you, He changes you. Now, real quick, real quick. Um, I told you I didn't grow up in a Christian family. I didn't, but I met the Lord. And I, I you know, God began to illuminate Himself to me, and I, I began to learn some things. Uh, I, I, one of the personal problems that I really faced was I had a problem in junior high with acne. Anybody ever had that kind of problem? 
Okay, am I the only one? Okay, all right. And uh, we, we didn't have a pro act, active there. We had uh, clear cell, remember that? And they used to have the clear cell commercials, and boy, it looked like, you know, in his face and so forth. And then if you use clear cell, then you kind of look like Brad Pitt, you know, and so on and so forth. And so uh, I thought, well, I'd be, I, you know, I'd be a good, you know, good uh, uh, actor for the before model, but they looked at my picture and said, don't think we can use you in the after model. So uh, I, I'll just be honest with you. When this began to hit me, um, I know it's stupid. I know it's illogical. But in junior high especially, uh, when, when I saw people beginning to look at my cheek, don't look at my cheeks. Uh, when I saw people look at my cheeks, uh, I, just, I just had this thought that go through my mind. They're looking at the ugly part of my face. I went through high school that way. They're looking at the other part of my face. I, I went to college that way. I went to graduate school, met the lovely Miss Pam. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, she said yes to my proposal. And uh, so, wow, I mean, pimples and all, you know. I mean, is God good or is God good? And then, and then it's two days before we're to commit matrimony. So you know how it is. Here we are as a young couple. And, and uh, so I cock and I at her. She cocks and I at me. We're standing there looking cock at one another. And, and then, and then uh, yeah, she, she starts doing this. She starts putting her hands on my hair like that. And I... Yes, I, I started coughing too. So anyway, <laughs> so anyway, start start doing this, and and uh, of course I had a lot more hair for her to run her fingers through. But I, I just want to tell you, uh, that just made me feel so good. And then she did the unthinkable. She started putting her hands on my cheeks, and uh, I don't know, I just. That's the ugly part of my face. And so I must have looked around a certain way. She said, is something wrong? I said, oh, no, I'm fine. So she did it again. And uh, she said, well, it looked like I'm hurting your cheeks. I said, oh, no, you're not hurting my cheeks. Well, it, 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 what's happening there? I mean, when I, touch your che- when I touched your cheeks, it looked like you were hurting. And I, well, honey, that's just an ugly part of my face. And Miss Pam looked at me. She said, you think that's an ugly part of your face? And she said, that's an ugly part of your face? She says, oh, honey, those scars don't make you look ugly. Those scars make you quite manly. (laughs) I want you to know, I went back to the apartment that night You see, in the morning when I was shaving and I was looking at those scars, uh, my memory goes back to a contest I was first runner-up in at Will Rogers High School. It was a real contest in those days. It was called the Ugly Man Contest. I was first runner-up. Don't feel bad. You should see the guy that won. (laughs) So, So here's the thing that got me. I looked, and I looked in the mirror, and I put my hands on the cheek, my cheeks, and all of a sudden it just hit me, and I thought, those scars do make me look quite manly. Now, what changed my mind? Now, listen to this. What changed my mind? What changed my mind was I got a personal word from someone I was about to be in a covenant love relationship who gave a whole new definition to my scars. And what I'm trying to tell you, and the reason why we want you to encounter Jesus is not so that, you know, it just be a good old time, God bless your little heart. No, because He changes you. He changes you. Yeah, all of a sudden you see life from a different perspective. All of a sudden you see some of the bad things that's happened to you and you realize God causes all things to good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. He even takes those bad things and He uses them to mold you and to, and, and, and to fashion you into His image. And that's why it's important that you know that you surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Is this making any sense? Yes. So now this is what I want you to do. I, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to pray. And I, I, I really believe there are some of you here t- this morning. God has beckoned you to come and surrender your scars, those bad, those bad images, uh, those negative experiences, and to surrender them to Him and say, God, I, I just let you change m- my whole perspective about that. I believe there's some of you here, you've been kind of thinking your, your spiritual gift is being a pubitate, and God is saying, no, I, I, I've called you, and I want to use you in a special way. What is that? I don't know. 
know. Um, maybe it's to help in Sunday school. Uh, maybe you're to be a greeter. I don't know. It may be a special ministry. You're like this one uh, elderly lady. Uh, she wanted to be used by God. She was 80 years old. Uh, they didn't let her. Well, she could sing in the choir as long as she hummed. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, they didn't let her in the nursery because she scared the kids. So the pastor gave her a clipboard, said, I want you to go to your go to your apartment complex and I want you to get the names of everyone in the apartment complex. Just say, I have been appointed as the intercessor for my church and uh, I'd like to come back once a week and just see how, you know, give me the prayer request and come back and see how it is. Six months later, she's standing up in tears and she says, I've had so many families about ready to break up. I started praying with them. And, and they're not breaking up. They're better than I've ever been before. I've got single mothers. All of a sudden they have vision and they're able to somewhat see there's a, a, there's a positive place for their children. Uh, I, I've had couples that uh, uh, God is talking to them. Uh, several backslidden Christians and many who were not Christians decide to come to church and many have received Jesus Christ. And, and what, what could the lady do? She couldn't sing. That ought to be, give hope to a lot of people here. She couldn't sing, but she could pray. She could pray. Do not let the devil tell you you are just being marginalized. I want to tell you, you surrender your life to God and say, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And then you find out how you find that out. Listen, listen. You will be shocked. I can give you story after story. Drug addicts. I mean, one drug addict came to our church at Hillcrest. I mean, he, this is before we had multicolor hair uh, configurations. Uh, he, he came to our church because he was told that the, the, the loveliest Baptist girls came to Hillcrest Baptist Church. That's not really a spiritual motivation, but nonetheless, God will use whatever he can get. So nonetheless, he, not only does he walk forward, he's crying, he's weeping, he's, he, you know, he wanted to be a big, uh, big band uh, not a big band, but a rock and roller. And so he comes to know the Lord. I mean, he's, God touches his life. Uh, we begin to disciple him. He becomes one of our interns, meets his wife there. Um, and uh, she ends up being a lawyer. And, and he's been the pastor of one of the strongest churches in Midwest City. I mean, think about that. A drug addict? Well, you don't know all the bad things I've done. Well, God's not looking at your past. He's looking at your purpose. He's looking at your purpose. And if you don't know what your purpose is, he'll be glad to tell you. So here's what we're going to do. I really believe there are some of you here that the Holy Spirit's beckoning you to come and be prayed for. Oh, before I forget it, don't let us leave until I take the sheet off. All right. <laughs> So I, I want you to understand something. You may not think it's that significant. You may just need to come forward. Maybe Pastor Mike needs to really pray with you about that issue. Maybe you need to surrender your life. You need to surrender your life to him. Or maybe it's a financial or a family issue. So as God is speaking, would you please stand? Would you please stand? And as the music is playing, don't hesitate. Just step right out. Just come to the front. God wants to do something great. I hope that the Holy Spirit really, really uh, uh, opened up an awareness. Christianity is a factual faith. Christianity is true. So as, the, as our brother begins to play this worship song, you come right now. You come right now. Just come to the front. Pray. Let God just speak. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ 
God is speaking to you. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my way, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Would you bow your heads with me for just a moment, please? With your heads bowed. have not yet begun your personal relationship with Jesus Christ I'm going to ask you to make this moment that beginning you say well how do I do that what do I what do I do well you admit to God God I've sinned I, I, I'm not worthy to have a relationship with you but I turn away from my sin the best I can, and I turn to you, and I ask you to save me. You say words close to those. I ask you to save me. I ask you to forgive me and to be the boss of my life. These folks standing to my left and to my right, they are ready to receive you. Yes, you, right now. So whether you just said those words with me or you go, I'd like to, I'd like to just pray with someone. I don't want to mess things up. You're not going to mess it up. Trust me. But what I'd like for you to do is to step out and take one of my friends to my left or the right by the hand. And I want you to do that now. Now. So you can take someone with you, grab them by the hand and say, go with me. Or you can step out on your own. But I'm asking you to do that right now in the name of Jesus. So come quickly, right now. You want to make this church your church home? You want to follow Christ in baptism? Come out right now. Right now. Because I'm not going to wait long. All you got to do is take that foot and scooch it out there. You're good. Come on. of you are trying to force your foot to scooch because I know you want to Father I'm going to pray for you Father in heaven for my friends in this room that God they, they it's time for them to take that step that step of obedience of following you <coughs> recentering their life with you uniting with this church following you in baptism God I pray for them very special right now that they would come at the close of my prayer, that they would step out and come. In Jesus' name. Now, I want everyone to keep their heads bowed. Some are going to scooch. Here's what I want you to do. With everything that Jim said and the songs that we have sang, this, is, this may sound weird, but I want you to take your hands, if you would, and cup them in front of you. Like you're going to hold some water. There you go. I want you to cup them in front of you like you're going to hold some water. But really what that's going to do is that that's going to represent your life. So what you're holding is your life. And what I want you to do with that 
as I want you to tell God, God, I give this to you. Just tell him. I give you all of it. The good, the bad, the stuff I'm ashamed of, the stuff I'm proud of. I give it all to you. Use my life, Lord. Tell him, use my life, Lord. Christ, it has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overthrow the grave to this I hold my sin has been defeated Jesus now and ever is my plea oh the chains are released i can sing i am free yet not i but through christ in me oh the chains are released i can sing i am free yet not i but through Christ in me. Thank you all so much for being here, for making this a priority this morning. Thank you. Uh, would you show your appreciation to Jim and to Rick, please, for allowing God to use them? As we continue to worship, I'm going to ask you to remember to place your tithe in that box or that one or this one. Those are your tithe boxes, your offering boxes. Uh, it, 100% of everything that goes in those boxes is, is goes toward the tithe unless it is specifically marked revival. And if it's marked revival, then that will be part of the love offering that will go to these two guys. Otherwise, it will be as your tithe. And thank you for being such a generous church. Uh, Praise God for what he did at the men's retreat and what he's continuing to do in people's lives. Jim and Rick were a part of that, led worship and taught. Uh, really appreciate those guys. Pre appreciate you men that were able to make that. The If Aztec gathering is this Friday and Saturday. I believe there's someone by that table still. You can slide out there and, and uh, still get signed up for that. The Seder. Guys, we're down to the deadline Today, tonight, this evening, last deadline, if you please get signed up for that. Um, you say, well, why do we have to sign up? It's not till April 8th or whatever it is. I think it's the 8th. It's so we can get a, a menu to you because you have the privilege of making a, a, a meal, all right? You, you get to be part of the meal. And so it's not macaroni and cheese stuff. This is like, you know, Jewish stuff. So you're going to be learning how to make that. You'll have that r recipe. We need you to get signed up so we can have a head count also for the lamb that uh, we will be uh, partaking in, and so please uh, make that a priority. Guest, if you're a guest here with us, I'd love for you to take just a brief moment. Meet me right outside the other side of those doors right there. Come over. we got a gift for you on behalf of the church that I have the privilege of, of uh, presenting to you. Come see me over there. 515, Jim, tablecloth, 515, that's a room, okay, 515 tonight, there's a meal in the fellowship hall, and that's for you. That meal is for you. It's also for your friends that you bring. We've got plenty of food. You come take part. 6.30 is the beginning of another service. Tonight, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, Jim and Rick will be here. You make plans. The meal the same time each night, tonight through Wednesday. 5.15 is the meal. 6.30 is the service each night. Don't forget that, and I hope to see you back. Jim, would you come share with us real quick uh, what's underneath the tablecloth? There you go. Keep them in suspense. That's why. Uh, 
Amen. <laughs> Amen. Let's pray. We'll be dismissed. Guests, come see me over here, please. Father in heaven, thank you for what we've learned today. Help us to put it to work and to share it with others. God, let us not walk away without processing this truth that we've been presented with. Um, God, we love you, and we thank you that our faith is indeed founded on facts. In Jesus' name, amen.